So I wanted to start this talk today with an Instagram post by the actor Jenna Duan in February 2020, during the eighth month of her pregnancy. The post had multiple images, including this moving one that featured the caption Hormone S. The images in the series are dreamy and serene, often black and white with faded colours, soft pinks, creams and blues. All of them, of course, emphasise the pregnancy bump through lacy slips and soft fabrics. The photos are also, of course, taken by a professional photographer who Joanne makes acknowledgement to in the many captions. As Marie Claire puts it, the pictures celebrate the different facets of what it means to be living in a pregnant body and highlight the strength and majesty of that body. The what it means suggesting that this professional photographic staging of pregnancy reflects a mirror image of how all pregnant embodiments are experienced. While the actor Rima Willis, amongst one of the first people to comment on the image, declared, honestly, you are goals in every way, moon goddess. Others simply stated divine, timeless, and so incredibly beautiful. Borrowing from Rima Willis, then, the title of this talk is Goals in Every Way, Moon Goddess, Shame and Instagram Pregnancy. So I came across these images through a mapping of digital pregnancy that is included in Instagram. It's also a combination of different projects where, where pregnancy has been a focal point or a touch point, and in combination with the developing concept of post-digital intimacy. That is to say, the research process hasn't been neat or ordered. Pregnancy is filtered in and out of focus, often alongside fitness, menstruation, breastfeeding, and well-being. As part of this, I followed the hashtags baby bump, the bump, pregnant style, pregnancy goals, bump style, among others. So the methodologically, this mapping through the hashtag itself creates a form of intimacy through a relational connection of images to each other within the platform. My analysis in this talk includes demonstrating the way the posts on Instagram reflect, firstly, the luminosity of transformation, making the changing body something both visually spectacular while also being apparently normal. A focus on blissful domesticity, either through loving heterosexuality or home interior or both that sits alongside pregnancy. And a recognition of labor or of complaint presented alongside perfection and a kind of continuation of the emphasis on beauty and fitness and the requirement to maintain a heterosexy body. So I'm starting this paper with the example of Duan's spectacularly luminous pregnancy, not only because it demonstrates the shift of intimacy into the public realm, but because in, in its normalizing perfection, in its strength and majesty, and in it being goals, I'm sort of starting to formulate a where next and specifically thinking about this in relation to shame. But before I do, I wanted to start by saying something about pregnancy itself as the object of research. So one of my reasons for focusing on pregnancy is its possibility. Pregnancy is useful to explore since it has the capacity to challenge neoliberal individualism and the concept of the coherent bounded body. The pregnant body breaches the boundary between self and other, or as Young has put it, the pregnant woman experiences her body as herself and not herself. It's in a movement to belong to another being, yet there are no other because her bodily boundaries shift. But I also think this radical possibility creates a nuanced and subtle form of power, one that is tightened in what I'm going to refer to as the context of a post-digital intimacy. So of all the capabilities of bodies, I'm focusing on pregnancy here, given its cultural and political significance. Pregnancy is over-invested with meaning symbolizing the beginning of all human and non-human animal life. However, it's also created a space for cultural expectations. For example, in the sexist assumption that to count as a woman means having become pregnant at some point, uh, represented by kind of ideas about biological clocks and so on. In addition, I think we need to be cautious in suggesting that there is radical potential in the pregnant body in the sense that not all people who identify as women get pregnant, not all people who identify as women can get pregnant for many reasons. And not all those that are pregnant want to be, again, for a variety of reasons. 
so that this all makes pregnancy a really ambivalent object for feminist analysis. The larger conceptual framework for this work is what I'm referring to as a post-digital intimacy, where the digital has expanded into intimate spaces in a way that I would argue has important implications and gender consequences, and through which gender power is subtly rearticulated. In my own framing of this term, although I'm aware there might be others uh, within the network, a post-digital intimacy brings together, firstly, the post-digital as a context where the digital structures all aspects of life without us perceiving its entanglement in our bodies, actions, or ourselves, nor its technological forms and functions. <clears throat> and with this, I've also been thinking recently about how we can locate this in the more than digital, in the same way that post-humanism speaks of the more than human. And then an understanding, on the other hand, of, of intimacy, where it means more than the warm, fuzzy feelings of reciprocal closeness, love and comfort. And that moves us away from, but doesn't exclude completely, notions of sexual intimacy or kinship intimacy. Instead, I've been interested in thinking of intimacy more, of, more as forms of relationality, proximity and recognition and including those moments where recognition is present with expectations that create the context for misrecognition, failure and rupture, and therefore feelings of anxiety and shame. I would argue that a post-digital intimacy could help us make sense of a context that is more broadly wrapped up in the blurring of the public and private, in the sense that when the distinction between what is and isn't digital becomes imperceptible, it makes sense that public or private as separate would also melt away, even while I would add these spaces have never really been as distinct as we would like to believe. In light of this, Duane's pregnancy images are not unique on Instagram. They're one example of a vast library of images, inviting what, <clears throat> what McRobbie has described as repetitive looking, that appears to reveal the naturalness of pregnancy through an aesthetic style of glamour, bliss, and easy perfection. <coughs> Thus, where pregnancy was once considered something to be kept hidden, the pregnant body is now spectacularly luminous. In Tyler's words, another body project to be directed and managed, another site of feminine performance anxiety, and thus, ironically, a new kind of confinement for women. By exposing elements of life typically associated with the private and the intimate, Joanne's images perfectly demonstrate this, revealing her pregnancy in the bath, the bedroom, and in intimate moments with her partner. Taking Joanne's example as one of this vast library of images, a number of themes emerge. The first of these are luminosity of transformations captured here through the use of the pre-baby and 22 weeks image alongside other uses of before and after photos. That is what we can see here is the physical transformation of the body in this image, but also in this case, the use of the sparkly filter and photo editing effects in the 22 weeks image, make the pregnant body more magical, more luminous and more spectacular. Like Jenna Duan's spectacular pregnancy, this body is also framed as something naturally emerging. As the caption states, constantly in awe of what the human body can do. The technological effect of sparkles appears to be created by the body as though in dialogue with it and acting as an embodiment of that awe, both what the body can do and a spectacular editing of it. This image also maps onto what others have noted around the temporality of pregnancy on social media. Rosie, for example, has analysed the baby bump on Pinterest, and especially the practice of photograph taking in the same gesture and location over the months of pregnancy. Rosie suggests that sharing and pinning such images represents a desire for a future good life, since pregnancy represents one success on the path to the normative perfect, um, which also includes marriage and motherhood. Drawing on Lauren Balanche, she suggests that such progression pictures make an ordinary life look and feel extraordinary, such that pre-baby, whilst normatively slim and heterosexually attractive, becomes dull in comparison to the pregnant body. 
This notion of the spectacular is further drawn on in reference to blissful domesticity. This includes a number of images that present pregnancy as the task of preparing the home nursery decoration and also of heterosexual coupledom, often um, with images of the couple holding onto and feeling the bump. This theme is evident across a range of contemporary pregnancy media. We can see this, for example, in The Bump, a website and app focused on pregnancy. So in our previous analysis, we discussed a feature titled Nursery Ideas, uh, Nursery Ideas which appears alongside similar nesting advice that suggests in a friendly tone that the user should treat the nursery like you would the rest of your home. Don't feel the need to fit into some old fashioned criteria, otherwise your child will grow up to have a terrible taste in decor. Meanwhile, a list of baby moon destinations on the Bumps website suggests the user have a last hurrah with your partner before you become a family of three. Such advice is presented as though heterosexual coupledom is essential to pregnant embodiment, erasing single same-sex and surrogacy pregnancies like the ones that Ricky has talked about. Furthermore, the locations proposed for such pre-childbirth vacations include beach, beach, spa and shopping holidays, implying particular forms of middle class capital and financial freedom. This theme sits alongside Tindenberg and Bayham's analysis of Instagram pregnancy, where women have to demonstrate their ability to maintain heterosexual, heterosexy femininity throughout pregnancy, seen in style the bump posts by sharing outfits and detail in health, fitness and beauty routines. For them, Instagram propagates specific, narrow, overlapping visions of what a normal pregnancy or normal pregnant woman should feel, look and act like. And finally, there's what we might call female complaint, a recognition of the labor of being pregnant presented alongside perfection. And this kind of continuation of beauty and fitness and the requirement to maintain a heterosexy body. This is often verbalized through the use of letterboards, for example, here as another form of temporality, a series of actions that need to be endlessly repeated. There is also a recognition of the frustrations of feminine domesticity, where again in the caption she says, doing all the household stuff is way harder. Even while in this image, the queen of the kingdom still embodies post-feminist perfection and is still imagined as striving towards it. We see this also in Joanne's captioning of her image, Hormoness, where hormones, often the object of complaint in other pregnancy media, are reimagined as the thing that brings her closer to being a goddess. As McRobbie has suggested, the visual representation of this kind of maternal media enables a cycle of perfect, imperfect resilience. In this formulation, expressing complaint becomes a reason to fix the self, or as others have put it, to bounce back. Failure becomes failure light, located in otherwise white, middle-class, normative pregnant bodies. So these themes map on well to the images presented to us by Duan's Instagram pregnancy. As I've suggested in expressing what is aspirational, hopeful or ideal, Instagram pregnancy circulates an expectation of what others might want to be and or cannot be. Or to return to Rema Willis's comment on these heavily stylized images, what does it mean when you are goals in every way, moon goddess? expresses the outcome of what others might want to achieve and where goals become a state of being. This use of goals has increasingly become a significant way of linking a range of lifestyle choices and practices across social media, including life goals, marriage goals, couple goals, fitness goals, and of course, pregnancy goals. Use next to images that embody such goals and demonstrate what the ambition should arguably look like. Goals has also, of course, been in the language of dieting and body control for a long time. Weight goals, for example, imply a target weight that has not yet been reached. Like other aspirational cultures, such as self-help, the existence of goals in dieting creates a self-fulfilling feedback loop and often supported by generating body shame. And as others have identified in analyses of post-feminist sentiment, there's a shift in focus from a certain centered 
um, object-centered goal of the good life, so things like money, career, and so on. And towards an emotional register, including positivity, well-being, happiness, and good feeling. There is then the construction of a social norm in being goals, with such goals also couched in images of whiteness, able-bodiedness, heterosexuality, and financial capital, as well as negating any discomfort, displeasure, pain, or even the messy fluidity of pregnant embodiment. My point is that for aspiration to be central to these post-digital intimacies and a blurred public-private, it means that shame is also crucial to their circulation. This, I would argue, is important and difficult since shame must be concealed and denied at all costs. Shame is therefore an important affect in the blurring of the public and the private, something I've become quite interested in exploring further in, in body cultures um, beyond pregnancy. So this image, for example, from uh, Fitzbo content. Shame is used to regulate social norms publicly whilst also being felt as a deeply private, embodied, visceral sensation. In Proben's words, shame illuminates our intense attachment to the world, our desire to be connected with others, a description which I think could easily be applied to social media itself as an intimate technology. <clears throat> as Lassen and Punte have, have suggested, social media is haunted by shame. Likewise, the themes I've discussed here are also about the haunting work that shame does, creating a moral, intimate economy of images that are presented as, as a normative perfection, both firstly attainable, for example, in the expressions of complaint or in, or in um, claiming that these bodies are, are expressions of the natural body, and completely unattainable, exclusionary and exclusive, located in white, able-bodied heterosexual bliss that is underscored by wealth and that refuses a range of emotional and embodied experiences. Um, and I will stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs>